This is episode 63 of Our Modern Heritage, the new home and family culture podcast. I'm your host, Jody Chafee. In this episode, I talked with Jessica Croker of Seed Bahad Yoga, and I met Jessica while working with the LDSHE East Homeschool Conference, and LDSHE stands for Latter-day Saint Home Educators. And so she refers to that conference because this topic is one that she teaches at the conference, and so that's why I learned about this and <laughs> learned about her and what an amazing person she is and what an awesome topic this is and how much she really embodies and personifies the philosophies that she uh, teaches through her yoga practice and through her coaching practice. So I hope you enjoy listening and are able to apply the things that we talk about in this episode. Jessica Croker is a registered yoga teacher and a mindful living coach, teaching well-attended classes, seminars, and workshops since 2013. She hosts a weekly podcast called The Seed Podcast to teach and inspire women that self-care isn't selfish and that when we put ourselves first, we can actually think about ourselves less. Through her website, www.seedpod.yoga, she runs an interactive, unselfish self-care coaching program, helping people really internalize and apply her mindful approach to self-care. Jessica has been homeschooling her six children, six children since the first one was born in 2000 and lives with her husband and children in Manassas, Virginia. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Jody. It's fun to be here. <laughs> so glad to have you. So tell us more about what inspired you to start your mindful living coaching and teaching yoga. Well, I, I started practicing yoga when I was pregnant with my second child. And, you know, I was not an exerciser growing up. I, I never could really find any. I'm just not athletic. I was the art kid. I lived in the art room during high school and I have a degree in art. But I also, you know, I think I was an only girl in a family of boys. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And... And I think part that and just the culture we live in, I had a lot of dislike of my body Mm -hmm. and thinking it should be different, that I should be able to do more things like a boy could, that, you know, like high school gym classes were totally demoralizing, should be able to run in front of everyone and enjoy it. You know, all of those kinds of things. I think... I just internalized a lot of body shame. Mm-hmm. And when I started practicing yoga, I was just like, this feels so good. And I love being in my body. Mm-hmm. It was so healing for me. And it was at that time where I was growing a new baby. And just the miraculous, like experiencing my body and really inhabiting it mm-hmm. and feeling some reverence for it was really, really life-changing for me. And so then that was like, that was the thing I did to move. I felt like that's what my body was made to do. Mm -hmm. And so I kept practicing yoga from that time when I had my second baby and I did it all different ways. Um, You know, I'd go to a class at the YMCA, I would do videos, I'd go to a yoga studio, all those kinds of different things. And I kind of always had it in this this picture in my mind that someday when I grew up, I would be a yoga teacher. (laughs) And I remember when I was pregnant with my sixth baby, I was in a class and we were just in the final relaxation at the end. And the teacher said something, and I can't even remember what it was exactly that she said, but I remember the feeling of like, you need to do this someday. Well, you need to help people feel this good in their bodies, especially women feel this good in their bodies someday. And so I kind of really had committed to the idea that I would, I someday I would become a yoga teacher when I was pregnant with that last baby. So when she was weaned, I um, went away for um, two chunks of time. They were each a week and a half So it was three weeks total. I just went and stayed at a yoga center in the mountains in Colorado and got my yoga teaching certification. And so I've been doing it since then. But 
you know, it wasn't just the physical part that was the most important to me. It was kind of learning all those tools of mindfulness and realizing that I am not defined by my thoughts, that I'm like, my brain can think things just because that's what brains do is think. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to believe everything that my brain says. Yeah. And so the first time I went to an LDSHE conference, Mm -hmm. I just remember thinking, you know, there were a lot of things about like how to teach your kids math and how to go through high school transcript and, and create that and all of these kinds of things. But I was like, do you know who's running these homeschools are the moms Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the moms need to know how to take care of themselves and they need to know that it's okay to take care of themselves. And not only that it's okay, but it's like an absolute necessity that they take care of themselves. Because I think how we feel about ourselves totally gets translated into the way we interact with our children. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you're, you're absolutely right. And, and relating that to this mommy culture of, you know, it's, it was almost, I don't know if it's still this way because I don't, I don't try not to like listen to the negative chatter that's out there, but for a long time, I listened to it a lot. (laughs) And a lot of it was, if you aren't 100% immersed in your motherhood and in childbearing and child rearing or things like that, or, or selfless acts of kindness or things like that, then there was something wrong with you, you know? And, and it was like, if you, if you as a mom posted, Oh, I took this time to go out by myself to do X, Y, and Z, or I'm going out with the girls or, and it's like, what, what about your kids? What are you doing with your kids? You know, things like that. Or, you know, and, and um, there wasn't a lot, there was just kind of a stigma around moms having that personal time or getting time away from their kids or saying, Oh, I can't be with my kids all the time <laughs> or things like that, you know, and, and just going, wait, what? How, that, that, then you're a horrible mom or things like that. And I just think that that's so unfair. That's so unfair to, to moms and to women in general and just people in general that we should be constantly in a state of sacrifice. Then that's just not fair. And and it's not natural. <laughs> it's not healthy. And so um, go, maybe, maybe you could go into a little bit more about that. Like, why is self-care not selfish? Well, I think that's, I mean, it could be, right? Sure. <laughs> like self, self-care could be totally selfish. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important that we understand what it is to be selfish versus being self-aware. Okay. That everyone has needs, right? And when we're the mom and we have all of these little people that all have needs, Mm -hmm. they have their physical needs need to be met. And that's a job of a parent is to see to it that the needs of their children are met, right? But that doesn't mean that us as grownups stop having needs, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Right. But part of adulthood is knowing how to meet your own needs. Right. It's almost like we have to learn right? how to parent ourselves. We do. It's, <laughs> I and, and I like to I like to kind of term it that way is that we have to do some self parenting. Mm-hmm. Right? Would would you let your child go for a whole day eating only junk food? How would you feel you, about yourself as a parent? Right. But then how many of us as moms will do that same thing? Like we'll neglect, we'll, we'll just, oh, I, I made sure everyone had a healthy breakfast and I got lunch for everyone, but I'm out of time for myself. So I'm going to just grab a handful of chips. Maybe I'll eat a banana. Right. right. But is that really modeling to our children what it's like to be a healthy grown up adult? Mm-hmm. Part of our job of, as parents is to help our children learn how to meet their own needs. That's, yeah. that's really what we do. And so that's important for us to realize that meeting our needs isn't all about being self-absorbed and thinking that I'm better than anyone else or worse than anyone else. It's actually 
seeing ourselves through the light of truth that we are worth spending some time with and we are worth taking care of and our bodies and our minds are worth feeding just as much as our children's or our husband's or our friends or anyone else's. Like it's seeing that we are all divine beings and that we're really the only ones that have any idea what we need. Mm -hmm. And so it's our job to see to it that our needs are met. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I like this idea too, of that being mindful that when you are mindful of what your needs are, you really, you really need to, it's almost, it is a skill to develop to be able to be mindful of what your needs are because we get so distracted or um, carried away in the day-to-day -day activities. Um, do you have a specific like tools or exercise for developing more mindfulness or advice about how to develop more mindfulness? Well, I think taking time to be quiet, you know, having habits of, prayer and journaling and some kind of personal study where you just have some time to be inside of yourself and not so wrapped up in all the things that are happening externally is really, really key. And it's something that we have to practice. It's something that we just have to repeatedly do over and over and over again so that we start to hear that own, our own inner voice more clearly when we're in the busy times of our yeah. lives too. So I, I think taking time to sit and I, and I do really feel strongly that everyone should practice meditation, mm -hmm. that it's something that you can do to just be quiet. And I was blown away when I learned about meditating because my whole life, you know, I grew up in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I've said prayers five times a day, probably for most of my life, right. you know, morning, night, and then for every meal, yep. at least. But I just had in my mind that saying a prayer most of the time was just like a rattling of my thoughts, that I was just kind of going through this laundry list of all the things that I was thankful for and all the things that I needed. Yeah. And then that was it. But then just realizing that I could just be still and listen to myself breathe and notice the things that were happening in my head and start to let those get quiet, mm -hmm. that that's the time that God could actually speak to me. And at my yoga teacher training, we just learned like one of the very first days we just learned a natural breath mantra that was super simple. It was just that our body says hum on the inhale and saw on the exhale. And so we just sat and meditated for 20 minutes, hum on the inhale and saw on the exhale. And it was really hard to sit there. It was the first time I'd ever sat for 20 minutes. Right. And just noticed like my mind was going everywhere. But I also had this great epiphany that that was pretty powerful because they told us before we meditated that hum sa means I am that. Hmm. So I am not the, I am not my thoughts. I'm not anything outside of me. I am that part of me that has always existed. I am that part of me that is connected with the divine. Mm -hmm. And so as I was breathing, just hum on the inhale and saw on the exhale, I just realized, it's like, this is the song I've been singing my whole life. I am a child of God, mm -hmm. right? And my breath is just naturally chanting that. And all I have to do is sit and be still. And that's still praying. That's a prayer. And that God can really communicate my worth to me when I do that. That's so powerful. When when I started learning about meditation, it was it really was a, an eye opener to just stop. I mean, we we get so caught up in these thoughts and that you know that monkey voice, that monkey brain, whatever it's called, you know, mm -hmm. all, the, all the things that come and go into into our thoughts. And yet, when we stop to become present, all those things just like float away. And 
And I, I remember seeing a quote somewhere that was just like, the thoughts are the, cl- we are the sky and the thoughts are the clouds. Right. And, you know, and things like that. And, but so often we try to hold on to those clouds or focus on them or give them more weight or value than, than they really deserve. And that that's what creates a lot of anxiety and, and stress in our lives. And so, yeah, I totally agree with this practice of meditation and mindfulness and slowing down. I saw this video recently on Facebook that was like, my, my goal this year was like, like 2019 is to survive, you know, and, and it goes through like just being present and doing this and that. And as I was watching it and I posted about this, it was like, you know, it got kind of misty a little. I'm just like, you know, that's so true. This is not about a lot of, cause a lot of times in my experience, I've been in survival mode for a long time, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm like, I really want to get to a point where I'm actually thriving. But at the same time, there's something to this level of survival that is saying I'm enough. And, and that you're not lowering your standards by saying I want to survive this year. What you're saying is I, I, I'm, an, I'm going to show up from a place of I'm enough and, and be present and slow down so that those present moments with myself, with my family are enough. And I think that the more we practice that, I think the more we're going to find that that is thriving because you're letting go of all of the extra stuff that is telling you, you should do this and that you should be, do, be this and that and hold on to the things that's saying you are enough. Right. Well, because for one thing, all of those shoulds that we try to attach to often are competing. <laughs> like they're totally contradictory. And if we just brought some awareness to that, right? Like I should, I don't know. Oh, I'll tell you some, my shoulds are, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I should be, I should be, I should get up and exercise, but I should get more sleep or I should yes. be teaching my children, but my house is a mess. So I should be cleaning my house. And all those things are always like battling in my mind. Yeah. So, the, so they're often, life. they're often battling mm-hmm. and we just kind of put ourselves into this box of all of these shoulds and they compete with each other. And so then we're totally feeling a sense of anxiety, a sense of not measuring up because actually it's impossible. You can't measure up to things that are totally opposite from each other or contradictory. And, and so part of just kind of slowing down or taking some time to have that feeling of I am enough. I am connected with God. He knows who I am. I am of infinite worth. Then we can start to kind of filter through all of the busyness Mm -hmm. of those things. I, you know, it's like that Max Lucado book. Oh yeah. Special, right. Mm -hmm. With the Wemix Mm -hmm. and all their dots and stars and how Lucia who went to see the, the um, Wemmick maker, the wood, the wood cover every day, none of the black dots stuck to her. And I really think that that's what those shoulds are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We put them on ourselves. I think the stars are the shoulds too. I think that when we mm-hmm. feel like we have to measure up to those other standards too, that's... Yeah. And they're, they're totally unnecessary. <laughs> And they create a lot of anxiety. Mm-hmm. And so we feel a whole lot of discontent. Yeah. But that's not ever what Heavenly Father really wants for us. He just wants us to know who we are. And we do need to live in a way that is like we need to accomplish things. Yeah. We need to make right. We, and we need goals to, and. You we know. need to set goals. We need to do things. We need to work toward our potential, but we can just do it one step at a time. And we don't have to ever, like, we just, we can just know that we can trust that we are enough mm-hmm. and things will work out the way that they're supposed to. And 
we can't do it all at once. But often when we let go of having too many expectations of ourselves, we're actually able to accomplish more because we're not spending so much emotional energy with all of that competing junk in our minds. Yeah, yeah. That's that's one of my problems is I have all this these lists of all these things that I want to do or lots of, you know, just stacks and stacks of books I want to read or things like that. And, and then um, it, it seems like having too much to do, it sounds like abundance, right? But I think that it actually translates to scarcity because you go, I don't have enough time to do that, or I don't have enough energy, or I don't, there's not enough, to, enough of me to go around. And but a really a true abundance of mindset is just going, I, I have enough and I can do enough. I, I have enough time to do what I need to do. And letting go of the fear of missing, missing out that if I don't do all of the things, and then you actually end up accomplishing more because you just, mm-hmm. if you just pause and take one step at a time. Well, and we have to realize that it's our thoughts that create our feelings yeah. and it's our internal experience that really is what creates our whole experience. Mm -hmm. It's the things that are going on inside of us that make our life feel like it's worth living or not. Mm -hmm. And and when we think that thought, like I'll never have enough time, I can never get everything done, right? That feels pretty overwhelming. That creates a sense of anxiety. But when you have that idea that there's always enough time, there will be enough time. There's always enough time, right? That gives you a sense of confidence and you feel empowered to be able to act and do the things that you need to do. And that w- it will work out, mm-hmm. you know? So I love this. This is, you know, and a lot of this translates back to, I, I just want to put, relate it back to family culture because, you know, you mentioned earlier that if we don't take care of ourselves, then that translates to how we treat other people. And it also, you know, demonstrates the way we model for our families, how to take care of ourselves, how, you know, what healthy behavior and activity looks like. And, you know, all of these things are so important that we establish what our values are around those habits and behaviors, what our values are around self-care and, and mindfulness and things like that so that we can, adopted into our family culture as a practice and mm-hmm. that we, we tried to develop on a daily, daily basis. And that's, that was one of the reasons I want to invite you to be on the podcast is you have this topic. We are what we continually do. The power of creating a structure of habits and rituals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Because I think that that's something that definitely comes back to this idea of our family culture because family culture is the it's it's our customs it's our rituals it's it's our what we bring to the table on a daily because based on our values and beliefs and our standards and things like that and what we believe about our roles and our responsibilities and things like that and the stories that we tell the narrative that we perpetuate you know the values and things and so i think that you know we are what we continually do is it's such an important topic to our family culture. You know, so how would you go about starting, you know, where, where do you begin when you, you know, do you start out by um, evaluating what your values are or, you know, where do you, where do you begin in this process of establishing these healthy rituals and, and habits? Healthy rituals and habits. Well, I'm trying to think of like uh, as a family where it, where it is that we begin and well even if it's just you you know because like you said you you model for your family you know and and a lot of times our kids aren't going to pick up on what we're trying to accomplish until they see us doing it you're right well and I think you know not our lives are repetitive (laughs) and and a lot of us want to resist structure we want to resist I don't need to have a routine or a schedule because then I'm locked into a box. Mm -hmm. Actually, you have a lot more freedom if you have some boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so we need to do that with ourselves and within our families because it really is the little things that are the big things. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think having some kind of a morning routine is pretty key. 
mm-hmm. and that you know as as individuals we do something that like helps our mind our body and our spirit like every morning that we figure out how we do that whether it's that we exercise whether you know and some some kinds of things really can fill the gamut Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's another reason I love yoga is that I feel like right exercise and meditation meditation, you know all at the same time but you know so I'm doing I'm feeding my mind and my spirit at the same time but we also need to decide how we want to fit those into our families and realize that you know we need to create a structure and so I feel like some kind of morning routine that addresses mind, body, and spirit for our whole family is really important too. Mm-hmm. And it's evolved how we've done it in my family mm-hmm. over the years, but we've always had some kind of a morning meeting devotional time. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that my kids sometimes groan at, but also are super thankful for <laughs> is that we have like a memory box. We just call it the memory box, but we're always working on memorizing some scripture and a poem or either the living Christ or the proclamation on the family. We're always working on memorizing something. Mm -hmm. So we have something in progress, something that we work on on even days, something we work on on odd days. And then we have all the numbered days from one to 31. So if it's the (laughs) eighth, then we just pull out what's What's, it's just a recipe box, but we pull out whatever got put in the eighth. You know, it's often like the eighth article of faith, and maybe some poem that we finished memorizing at some point. Okay. And then we'll recite that thing. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it takes us five minutes a day. Right. It takes five minutes a day, maybe sometimes 10 at the most. But they will watch a general conference talk and be like, oh, I know that scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this last, this past conference, it was, it seemed like 80% of the talks had some scripture that they had memorized that they knew, you know, that they were familiar with. And that's just a little tiny ritual that has really fed into our family culture. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can think about, okay, what is it that our, what, what need do we need to fulfill? Like what is some kind of need we need to fulfill? And what is a method that we can use to meet that need? And mm-hmm. how can we make it as small and simple as possible so that it can be repeated over and over again? Yeah. Because I think one of the things that you said right at the beginning was how when we have habits and rituals, then it actually takes up less mental power to accomplish those things, which is why Sometimes we have habits and we go, I didn't realize that was my habit. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, but when you, estab- when you work on establishing the right kind of or good habits and things like that, then it becomes easier over time because it takes less mental energy to accomplish those things. Like I can't remember what book it was that I read about. It might have been, I can't remember now. But it was like, you know, the people who are really successful – they get up and they do the exact same thing for their morning routine and they even wear the same clothes every day because so that they don't run out of mental energy to do all the things that really matter <laughs> to them. Um, so I think that that's really an, an important idea around why it's so important to establish good habits and routines because a lot of times we go through those routines without even thinking about them. And so it's really important to make sure that you're establishing the right kinds of routines. Yeah, and you're right. People, like I said, before we started was like, you know, a, uh, a, a pivot, you know, what was it? What does they say? A door swings on a single pivot or something like that. You know, that it's like, if you have those right, it's, it's just a little tiny thing that, that starts you out on the right course. But like you said, with your kids and doing those scriptures and memorizing those things, those are things that just take a few minutes and then it carries it over into every aspect of their lives. And it's something that they can keep coming back to and keep remembering and keep reinforcing because it's something that almost becomes a part of who they are. Well, we have habits, right? That's just part of the natural man that we're made to work in patterns. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how our brains develop is that 
you know, they want to follow the easiest pathway. Yeah. And so we're born with a brain that doesn't have all of those neural pathways connected. Like that's a whole, that's the whole purpose of childhood is to create all of those neural connections. Right. And to build our brains. And then all that stuff that's automatic, like our brain wants to delegate as much as it can to the automatic so that, you know, we can drive to the grocery store without even thinking about it. Uh We brush our teeth probably the same, you know, we start in the same place and end in the same place the same way every time. Because so we don't ever even have to think about it. And we're going to have habits and patterns that we follow over and over again, whether we want to or not. That's just the nature of being a human being. Yeah. And so we can choose them. Uh Like, that's pretty cool that we can choose them and make those pathways the easiest ones to follow. We can decide that when I get out of bed, I automatically kneel. That's the first thing I do and say a prayer. We can choose that that's our pattern Mm -hmm. and it takes a while to make it automatic. But then once we make those things automatic, right, then our needs are being met. And then we have a whole lot of energy and light to do all the other amazing things that we want to do. So in, in this talk that you gave it, and you gave this at the LDSHE conference, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, how do you notice when there's habits that's not serving you anymore? And what is the process and the struggle of changing that habit into something that's better? Well, I think one of the most important things that we can do is just not judge ourselves, right? We have to just be like, hmm, I do this thing over and over again, and that's okay because I'm just a human. I, I yell at my kids every time they take their shoes off five minutes before we're trying to get in the car, right? <laughs> it's just my knee-jerk reaction. I always do that, and it's a habit I want to change, but it's okay. I'm a human. I'm just being a mom, being a normal mom right? We have to, when we notice that there's something we habitually do that we don't want to do anymore, we're going to compound it if we resist it. If we put a whole lot of focus and saying, I'm bad, right? Instead of just being like, this is, this is what it is. And then we can start to just redirect ourselves to something new. Mm -hmm. So when we have something that we don't want to be doing, all the time, then we have to kind of create systems. You know, I, for a long time, struggled with just like binge eating in the afternoon when it was, I was just kind of spent mentally, emotionally spent for the day after homeschooling six children, (laughs) you know, and the chocolate chip bag is just so, (laughs) it's just right there, right? It's so comforting, (laughs) you know? And so, The system that I had to create to overcome that habit was that I always have sliced up cucumbers in the fridge or celery or something. And then in the afternoon, I just get that out and set it on the counter so that it's there where I can see it. And I realize, okay, if I'm going to binge, it's going to be on celery, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Yeah. But we have to, you know, we just have to find something that will replace it. Yeah. And then we have to find some way to be accountable, whether it's just some kind of little chart where we just check off boxes, whether it's someone that we tell every day. But I think that is another really helpful way in establishing a habit, right? Because it's going to take doing something a hundred times or more Mm -hmm. before we create that easy pathway in our brain that it makes it easy to follow over and over again. Yeah, because it's not, it's not easy to change. Those neural pathways, they've grown over with all of that myelination, you know, and, they, and they, your brain wants to keep going back down that path over and over again because it's comfortable, it's, it's easy, um, mm-hmm. and it takes extra mental energy to, to reroute those neural pathways to something else. I think that another important thing would be to figuring out really strongly why 
you want to change those things. I mean, yes, it's important not to judge yourself. I totally love that you said that (laughs) because it's true. You don't want to create a, a negative thing around, you know, why you're changing. You don't want to make it about, I mean, you talked in the beginning about your body image and things like that. It's like, don't make it about that. Don't make it about whatever it's just to make it about something the reason why it's you do those things because you love yourself or because there's another more powerful reason because mm-hmm. ultimately some some of these negative things like if you have a body image issue you're going to find that that's not going to be resolved by a, an external solution <laughs> right it's got to be something that's coming from inside of you and so i think that having that strong vision of why or, or maybe even picturing yourself accomplishing the outcome. Because, you know, as powerful as our thoughts are to, you know, we talked about this chatter of the shoulds and all these kinds of things. Our thoughts are, are real things. That if we, if we don't get them under control or, or we don't, aren't directing them um, intentionally, they really are real things that shape our lives. And it can start with shaping your thoughts around what your vision is for the outcome that you want, because then that is what becomes real to you. Have you ever, have you experienced that? Or have you learned about, about that aspect of yeah. like visualization and how powerful that is? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> what is your experience with that? Well, so we'll just do it an easy one. I mean, okay. I, I really have really, I mean, that's what faith is. Right. Faith is that power to believe something that you don't see yet, but yeah. being able to see it before it happens. And so, you know, I've had some really powerful experiences with that in my life, but we can take an easy one. Say, well, one that you had talked about in this, in this um, presentation was something that I actually did when you were talking about the presentation. It was close your eyes and like visualize your, yourself, right? Something like that. Yeah. Well, I, I love, I love um, just guiding people through like a meditation where they visit their, their future self. Right. And you just imagine yourself, you know, 30 years in the future and, you know, your wisest, most evolved, experienced version of you. And just imagine like, what, what is she like? Her, what are her surroundings like? What does she look like? What is she wearing? How does she spend her time? That can start to really let all of the extraneous, unnecessary stuff fall away. Like what, what is it that I'm becoming eventually, mm-hmm. right? And it can take a long time and that's okay. But also just kind of ask her some questions and tell her what's going on. Like tell her all of the hard things that are happening in your life and the things that you can't handle. And then ask some advice. Like, what is it that she has to say? Mm -hmm. And that can kind of help us really see what is important and what doesn't matter and what things are worth doing, what things that we should keep doing. Mm -hmm. But it's really important to realize like, it's okay for things to be hard and it's important for us to see where it is that we want to go, but also realize that our lives aren't meant to be easy, right? A lot of times we think that we're just supposed to feel happy all the time, right? But that's not the truth, right? That's totally a false idea. And often you know, if we want to change something, we have to be willing to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to have the urge and the desire and know the chocolate chips are in the pantry and just eat celery and cucumbers anyway, right? And so that's one of the things, like we need to see where it is that we want to go. We have to visualize it. And then we have to realize that it's worth it to get there. And that we are going to be, we have to be willing to feel some pain and discomfort and awkwardness, right? Like imagine brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand, 
right? Right. If we were trying to change that kind of a pattern, it's going to be awkward and you might get slobber all over the place. And that's okay. Like if you want to stop a habit of yelling at your kids, or if you want to stop a habit, it it will be just like trying to brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand and you probably will mess it up. Yeah. And that's okay too. Yeah. But that we can realize that we will get to our destination. Yeah. It's all part of that process and, Mm -hmm. and the journey of realizing your potential and that vision that you have inside of you of, of what you're what you're aiming for and that it's okay. Yeah. (laughs) As long as you're, you know, I recently heard this quote. It was like, as long as you're going in the right direction, you're making progress. Because if you, I mean, if you're not going in the right direction, it doesn't matter how fast you're going. Mm -hmm. You're never going to reach your destination. Yeah. But as long as you're going in the right direction, it doesn't matter how quickly you're going, you're still making progress. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And that's why it's important to like realize it's just the little things that our habits are the big things. They're the things that make up our whole life. Mm-hmm. All those little things that we do with day in and day out. Yeah. They have a, the big cumulative effect. Yeah. In the they add up. They add up over time. Mm-hmm. It's so true. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. This has been really I I think we could go on and on and on. (laughs) There's so much more I think we could talk about. I mean, you you have brought up some concepts and I mentioned to you this book called The Slight Edge and that's a really good one to check out because it talks about this idea of how our actions compound onto Mm -hmm. each other. And and there's also an old Brigham Young University devotional by um, Henry B. Eyring called The Law of Increasing Returns. That was really good. It's about that same kind of concept. What are some books that you like to recommend that can help this concept or about developing good habits or mindfulness or self-care? Well, one that I think is really helpful is called The Power of Full Engagement. You and I have talked about that book before. Mm -hmm. And that one just talks about that we need to have rituals and routines that help us renew our energy. That's how we do it, is by doing just little things. I also like a book called Better Than Before by Gretchen Rubin. Uh And Mm -hmm. she, it's just about building habits. And she has a bazillion different strategies, probably not a bazillion, more like 25 (laughs) (laughs) strategies for creating a habit. And that we have to take into account our own natural tendencies, that some of us work better if we are obligated to do something and that we shouldn't berate ourselves for being people pleasers, you Mm -hmm. know, and I've noticed like for me, if I commit to someone that I'm going to do something, it's way easier for me to get it done. Mm -hmm. And I can just harness that as a superpower instead of saying, Oh, I'm so not self-motivated. Right. No. And so she has, she talks about the four natural tendencies and Mm -hmm. that when we create our habits, we should take into account what our natural tendencies are. And I think in a family culture, right, our families also, like some families are very rigid and structured and they function that way. Some families are mostly extroverts, Mm -hmm. right? And so they're going to do outward things. And then there are other families that are more introverted. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay to create habits within your family that really support your your natural tendencies Mm -hmm. without any judgment, right? We need everyone, all the different flavors. And so those are, those are two good books about creating habits. Yeah. That's, those are awesome suggestions. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you so much. Jessica, thank you so much for your thoughts and sharing these, these ideas and things. And I just know that when we, you know, harness the power of our habits, they really will shape our family culture. And, and the way that we shape our family culture now is the way that we can shape the culture at large, you know, and, and, and as we parent ourselves, we can help our children learn how to, to parent themselves too. (laughs) So thank you so much for sharing that. And tell us one more time what your URL is and where we can find you online. Okay. Thanks. Well, 
every week I post a like 20 to 30 minute teaching on the seed podcast. So you can just search on iTunes or Google play or anything like that. That's the seed podcast. Mm -hmm. And my website is www.seedpod.yoga. And you can also find me on Facebook at the seed pod yoga Facebook page. Thank you so much, Jessica, for being on the show. I love talking with her so much. I just loved her whole um, personality. She's so calm and peaceful, and she really does personify the message and the in the teachings and the philosophies that she believes in about yoga and mindfulness and spirituality. And I really admire Jessica a lot, and I appreciate everything that she shared in this episode and I hope you'll go check out her website at seedpod.yoga and you can find her on Facebook like she said and you can learn more about what we talked about if you go to my show notes at homeandfamilyculture.com thank you so much for listening and I love getting your feedback you can like rate and share on your favorite broadcasting medium like iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or You can go check me out on social media. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest at homeandfamilyculture.com and on Twitter at underscore familyculture. Thank you so much for listening. Mother Teresa once said, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family.